Hello there, it's nice to have you with us and a special welcome to all sound engineers. There was probably no need at all to play that waltz by Johann Strauss, a case perhaps of taking coals to Newcastle. But were you aware that it all began with the Edison cylinder more than a hundred years ago? I'm sure you were. But did you know that the tape deck celebrates its 50th birthday this year in 1985? Alongside gramophone records, the tape deck occupies a very special position among equipment for conserving sound. After all, you can do more than simply reproduce sound. You can record with the same unit, and, probably the most remarkable feature, you can process such recordings extremely accurately, rapidly and easily. For this reason, tape decks have become essentials in any radio or television studio. The tape recorder was first introduced at the 1935 radio exhibition in Berlin. Its creator, the engineer Eduard Schuller of AEG, already one of Europe's giants for electrical equipment. At first, though, there were upsetting moments, for the first five magnetophones, as they were known, were lost after only a few days when disaster struck in the shape of fire in the small hours of the 20th of August, 1935. Also lost then, the prototype he had demonstrated secretly to a small group of journalists the previous year. Eduard Schuller, at the time in charge of a laboratory at one of AEG's Berlin works, and father of the world's first tape recorder, himself recalls what happened. Ja, es war eine große Katastrophe. Wir saßen an dem Abend noch über unsere Geräte gebeugt und reparierten und sahen alles durch, was am Tage äh, defekt geworden war. It was a great catastrophe. That evening, we were bending over our equipment, repairing the various units and testing their functions, getting things put right again following the day, for they were still rather prone to failure. As we were busy, we suddenly heard the shout of fire, and that came from a nearby stand in the exhibition, and it wasn't long before everything around us was in flames. Indeed, we had to run for our lives, leaving all of our equipment behind. Uh, luckily, we had so many parts in stock that we were able to put together several new machines again. Uh, the radio exhibition was extended for another week, and at the end of that week, we were able to display a couple of units on our new stand. Uh, the interest shown by the general public was enormous. Everyone wanted to hear his voice coming over. It was a great novelty and really very impressive. Unseren beiden Geräten auf unserem Stand. Die Leute interessierten sich enorm dafür. Jeder wollte einmal aufsprechen, um seine eigene Stimme zu hören. Das war etwas verblüffend, Neues für alle und sehr eindrucksvoll. The idea of conserving sound, of registering events for posterity, is a very old one. Back in the 17th century, for instance, the Italian physicist Porter suggested speaking into a lead tube, which should then be closed forthwith. Once opened at another spot, one could hear the same words again. Well, if anything, Porter's idea is even more fantastic than the story involving the coach driver from Münchhausen, whose music became frozen inside his post horn during one cold winter and thawed out again inside a cosy inn. But really, I suppose, that story wasn't quite so stupid after all, for when you want to record something, it's also a type of freezing. Only, at the time, no one really knew what had to be frozen and how this could be accomplished. Notwithstanding, it turned out to be possible, some 150 years later, to scratch the vibrations of tuning forks with the aid of a small pin onto moving surface covered with soot. It wasn't exactly words or music, mind you. That was accomplished in 1857 by Leon Scott, a physicist, using a similar method. He also used a rust-covered surface, only it was round, a cardboard cylinder which he could turn, and this meant that he had made a giant step forward without actually knowing it, although his cardboard cylinder suit process still didn't enable him to reproduce the sounds. This took another 20 years, and the brilliant ideas of the French theoretician Charles Crow and the versatile American inventor Thomas Alva Edison. Today, Edison is regarded as the inventor of the reproducible sound recording, 
something which has a lot to do with his personality, a cross between a dynamic practitioner full of fantasy and a clever businessman in best American tradition. At any rate, he was able, in contrast to the Frenchman Crow, to perfect the invention for practical use within a short time and exploit it commercially. But what had he been able to achieve in technical terms, so that the breakthrough to arrive at the first real conservation of sound was accomplished? Well, in actual fact, only a small step, but this was terribly important. He also used the rotating cylinder, but instead of coating it with soot, he selected tin foil. It was soft enough to press in the sound oscillations with the help of a sharp needle, which was attached to a membrane, but at the same time. Hard enough in order to enable the needle and also the membrane to reproduce the acoustic oscillations when played again. There are all sorts of stories about inventors, and it's doubtful whether they're true or not. At the same time, it's always a good thing to have an invention tied up with some quirk of fate. It's suggested, for instance, that one day Edison's finger was pierced by a needle. Which he had attached to a membrane, and this is what resulted in sparking off his idea about the phonograph. It might be true, but it's a fact that on August the twelfth, eighteen seventy-seven, when Edison wound up the tinfoil-covered cylinder, the tiny metal membrane began speaking in the real sense of the word. Admittedly, scratchily, but it could not be overheard that it was repeating what Edison had said shortly before. Mary had a little lamb. The birth of recorded sound had taken place. Thereafter, sound-reproducing engineers made rapid headway. Emil Berliner invented the gramophone record, which could be more easily produced in large numbers. Every artist who was worth his salt wanted his voice conserved on record. As here, for instance, Enrico Caruso was the aria celeste Aida, dating back to 1903. Between Caruso, who found himself singing into a huge metal trumpet, and our next historical example, twenty-five years elapsed. This meant the First World War and the revolutionary invention of electric sound recording. Many a merry ditty came from the Rhineland at the time, and the doyen of all popular carnival song composers, Willy Ostermann, achieved previously unprecedented popularity among our parents and grandparents with his recordings. Ihr wisst das wunderbare, das schönste Plätzchen mit am Rhein. Wo Sachen habt die sieben Berge, die schlagen zum Bewundern ein. Wo frohe Menschen sich bewegen, wo laut der Mädels lachen klingt, wo dir das Ich für alle Wegen wie nixen sang zum Up till then, and for many years afterwards, all gramophone records were live products. For the subsequent reprocessing of a recording wasn't possible. Not until the invention of the magnetic tape and an appropriate device to record and reproduce it. In other words, the magnetophone. Although the original concept of magnetic sound conservation was almost as old as Edison's phonograph. After all, in 1888, a certain Oberlin Smith had published an article dealing with a possible form of the phonograph. It's surprising just how many important elements of modern tape recorders were mentioned. For instance, Smith suggested that a tape of silk or cotton incorporating steel powder or cuttings should be used as a sound recording medium, 
which should be guided past a wire coil through which microphone currents were flowing. It's not certain if Smith also put his idea into practice. It is certain, though, that he also came up with the idea of using massive steel wire as a sound recording medium, but did not believe that the magnetic acoustic oscillations could be traced with sufficient accuracy. Nonetheless, his reasoning wasn't far off. After all, a few years later, the Dane, Waldemar Poulsen, realized this in practice. A patent's office is surely about the best place to visit if you want to recall the history of a technical development. A patent reflects the thoughts and the personality of the inventor, the struggle of the human spirit, and the realization of new ideas better than anything else. The patent represents the visa by means of which a theoretical idea enters the realm of technology, the link between yesterday's theory and tomorrow's practice. This also applies to the Dane, Waldemar Poulsen, who was awarded the patent number 109569 in Germany on the 10th of December, 1898. It describes the first machine capable of recording sound on a steel wire, in other words, magnetically, and of reproducing it. He called his device the telegraphone, and two years later, at the World Fair in Paris, in 1900, he was awarded the Grand Prix for it. In the years that followed, many firms took up his idea, improved the mechanical system, and developed units ready to go into series production. Far enough, at least, for the telegraphone to be able to record all speeches held at the International Engineers Congress in Copenhagen in 1908 on wire. However, as can happen, this was one technical invention which came onto the market at the wrong time, like so many others. And no matter how clever they may be, they find themselves overtaken by other developments which appear to promise greater success. And that's what happened to the telegraphone, in spite of honors and temporary successes. Reproduction was too quiet, amplifying tubes had yet to be invented, and later on, when radio had well and truly established itself, the pronounced surface noises caused by the steel tape method were found to be unacceptable and the sound range inadequate. The gramophone record had long overtaken the magnetic sound recording in this respect. In addition, the weight of the wire coils, whose threads often got tangled, proved to be a considerable disadvantage. Additional trouble was caused by the wire breaking, something which could only be repaired by welding. If only it were possible to cover a narrow strip of paper with steel wire, finely rolled iron or even iron powder. After all, if paper tears, you can always stick it together again. At the time, this was indeed a problem. But who'd come up with a solution? Well, someone had it in his head, or perhaps we'd better say on his lips. In the mid-twenties, there was an inventive fellow by the name of Fritz Fleumer, who had devoted his time and energy to inventing a new golden tip for cigarettes. At the time, the expensive brands had tips made of genuine gold leaf, the cheaper ones were a bronzed paper, which left nasty traces on both fingers and lips. Fleumer came up with a better idea. He embedded the bronze powder in a plastic film, which no longer stained, but looked like real gold. Once he'd commercially exploited this invention, as well as many other ones, such as foam plastic and plastic drinking straws, he was sitting in a boulevard cafe in Paris one day, pondering over possible applications for his new metal film. Well, perhaps he was reminded of old physics books, or was it an article about the steel tape sound recording unit propagated at the time by Kurt Stiller? No one really knows exactly, but according to Fleumer, he suddenly had the idea of using a thin tape of paper with a steel powder coating instead of the steel tape. 
Floymer energetically pursued this notion in spite of the fact that the development of the gramophone record and the talkies was making great strides forward. He didn't give up, though, for a tape of this nature promised a longer playing duration, was cheaper to produce, and seemed likely to open up many new fields of application. In 1932, the outcome was the conclusion of a contract between Floymer and the AEG. At first, however, the hope that a marketable product could be realized in a short period using his paper magnetic tapes proved to be false. The adverse economic conditions prevailing at the time meant that there was no substantial sums available for the necessary research and development. Luckily, there was the then president of the board of AEG, Geheimrat Bucher. He was so enthusiastic about the magnetic tape idea that he threw in his own considerable prestige in order to keep the project moving. Thanks to his support, developments continued. Later on, when times were even more difficult, thanks to his close acquaintanceship with the then chairman of the board of IG Farben, Geheimrat Bosch, he was able to get BASF involved in trials to produce magnetic film tapes. At the same time, the AEG commissioned the young engineer, Eduard Schuller, to develop a corresponding recording and playback device. Eduard Schuller relates how this came about. Ja, ich war damals ein frisch gebackener Diplomingenieur, kam von der Hochschule, war am Heinrich Herz Institut und meine Diplom Yes, at the time I was a young engineer who just graduated and worked at the Heinrich Herz Institute. And my graduate paper concerned investigations into magnetic recordings using steel tape. One day, Herr Fleumer turned up and showed me a section of paper tape coated with iron powder and asked me to try and find out what could be done with it. We tested it and discovered that it was able to produce a good quality, at least for the time. It was quite impressive, in fact. Herr Floymer went to AEG and the AEG was also most impressed by the demonstration. I was engaged by AEG and commissioned to develop a tape deck. Now, the difficult thing about this project was that these paper tapes were extremely sensitive and tore the moment they were subjected to stress. Now, later, the tapes were made of plastic, produced by BASF. Now, these were a bit better. Then I developed the ring core head for recording and playback the answer to our various problems. Uh, the ring core head was developed and of course nowadays the same core head is still used in principle. The first machines at the radio exhibition 50 years ago. Uh, we decided to call them the magnetophone units. The name was conceived by Heimrat Bücher, the AEG chairman of the board at the time, from various suggestions that seemed to be the best choice to us. And the name has been retained until today. Der seiner Zeit von unserem Geheimrat Bücher vorgeschlagen wurde. Es waren mehrere Namen vorgeschlagen und dieser wurde eben als der geeignetste empfunden und er hat sich ja auch tatsächlich in der Praxis sehr gut eingeführt. In this way, the birth of the magnetophone was heralded in, thanks to the ring core head, the magnetophone and the plastic tape, elements which have remained practically unchanged until today, the first three steps were accomplished. But the fourth and essential one was still missing. In spite of all the advantages displayed by the magnetophone, there was still a very disturbing factor, the basic surface noises for which no remedy was available. A recording dating back to 1935, made in one of the first magnetophones, which ran at a speed of one meter per second, reveals this disadvantage clearly. It wasn't exactly hi-fi, was it? What was still lacking was the final step, high-frequency magnetic bias. This was discovered in 1940, quite by chance, by the two physicists, Dr. von Braunmühl and Dr. Weber, in a laboratory belonging to the German radio network. Dr. von Braunmühl now looks back to that auspicious day in an interview. 
First, the reporter asked him, was the story that the high-frequency magnetic bias for tape decks was discovered quite by chance? Was this a true story, or was it simply made up? Es beruht schon auf Tatsachen. Die Dinge liefen damals so, dass ich mich zusammen mit meinem außerordentlich begabten Mitarbeiter Dr. It's based upon fact. And the way things were at the time, I was working together with a good colleague of mine, Dr. Weber, investigating sound recordings and how to improve these sound recordings, particularly how to reduce surface noises. The tests we carried out at the time failed to produce positive results, until one day we struck lucky by chance. How does this come about? Well, an amplifier, which was actually only meant to amplify the acoustic oscillations, suddenly started to go haywire. In other words, it produced high frequency, just like a transmitter. And to our great surprise, the surface noise all of a sudden practically disappeared. It could hardly be heard at all. In other words, high frequency magnetic bias might never have been discovered if the faulty working of this amplifier had not been taken as a scientific principle. You're quite right. Chance came to our aid. Otherwise, it might never have been discovered. We were both physicists and interested as scientists and wanted to find out what was behind this all. Uh, various investigations were carried out uh, to examine intermolecular structures of the individual magnetizable particles. But to explain all this at length would take up a great deal more time than we have available. What sort of improvement was arrived at with regard to the tape and to the reduction in surface noise? We use a given number of decibels to describe the value of the disturbance factor. The old direct current magnetophone, like the gramophone record and sound film, had a disturbance factor of 38 decibels. In other words, it was improved by 20 decibels. A second advantage, incidentally, was that thanks to the low disturbance noise, the frequency range could be extended to the upper range of audibility. Now, this meant that a recording process had been arrived at which fulfilled all demands made of it, both with regard to the range of audibility and the reduced surface noise. The advantage was, if I can add that, that you can also improve the frequency of 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 the frequency welches hinsichtlich des Tonumfangs und hinsichtlich des Störgeräusches eigentlich keinen Wunsch mehr offen ließ und man konnte die Entwicklung abschließen. As from July the 28th, 1940, the two physicists, Dr. von Braunmüll and Dr. Weber, were awarded the patent for high-frequency magnetic bias, number 743411, by the Berlin Patents Office. It could be suggested that they not only succeeded in recognizing an error, but raised this to the status of a principle. Otherwise, presumably, the magnetophone would never have become the top sound recording unit that it is today in studios throughout the world. A recording from 1940 with the famous German actor Heinrich George demonstrates just what a difference high-frequency magnetic bias actually made. Herr Wirt, und da ich frage... Was gibt's? Ein Glas Brandewein, antwortet er, indem er sein Schwert in die Scheide wirft. Mich dürstet. Ja, Gott im Himmel, sag ich, will er machen, Freund, dass er wegkommt. Die Franzosen sind ja dicht vor dem Dorf. Ei, was, spricht er, indem er dem Pferd den Zügel über den Hals legt. Ich habe den ganzen Tag nichts genossen. In spite of World War II, the recording tape and the magnetophone continued to be developed. Soon, the first small unit for radio reporters with spring work and a tape speed of 19 centimeters per second was created. A speed which today is the standard one for high-quality home recordings, but which at the time even experts couldn't credit. The capitulation, however, signified a temporary break in progress as far as German magnetic sound was concerned. The advancing Victor powers were somewhat taken aback when they found magnetophones in German radio studios, for this was the first they'd heard of them. But 
they were only themselves to blame, for in the winter of 1937-38, a handful of managers without proper vision in the United States had discounted prospects for the magnetophone. Otherwise, the Allies' radio specialists would only have been surprised if they hadn't found such decks in German studios. As magnetophones were regarded as non-military objects, it wasn't long before AEG started with new developments again. The first post-war recorder, the T9, and later, following many intermediate stages, the practically legendary M5 was developed. Subsequently, the M10 and the M15 were brought out, equipment which can be found, for instance, in almost every German radio station. Anyone listening to the spate of music produced by the various programs of the German radio network can be practically certain that a magnetophone produced by AEG Telefunken is the source of these lively sounds. To coincide with the 50th birthday of magnetic tape recordings, a new development from AEG Telefunken, the M21, is beginning to establish itself on the market one of the most variable stereo studio tape decks on the world market. Microprocessor controlled, easy to operate, and a glass metal long life head technique, these are only a few of the numerous attributes of this latest magnetophone version, the grandchild of the 50-year-old K1 from 1935. For a good 50 years now at AEG Telefunken, on the shores of Lake Constance, Inspired and creative engineers have been engaged in the further development of conserving sound, as introduced by Edison, advanced by Poulsen, and rounded off by Schiller. How delighted good old waltz king Johann Strauss would have been some 90 years ago if he'd been able to hear his voices of spring waltz reproduced by a modern magnetophone. An original recording of Johann Strauss and a present-day example demonstrate the enormous progress made in a field which has become an integral part of our civilization and which provides some enjoyable moments in our otherwise often hectic and rather drab everyday life. 